we'll dive into our devotion today. Father, we are grateful that we're able to meet like we are today, even if it's different, even if it's smaller than normal. We still have many people that do not feel comfortable uh, coming together. And, uh, Father, I do hope they're taking advantage of watching online and, and doing things like that, doing their own personal Bible study. But I'm thankful that you've given us technology to be able to do what we're doing today and also uh, your blessing that, that a few are able to be here in person. And um, God, I thank you in spite of this pandemic for how you've protected our people. I pray you'll continue to do that. And Lord, I pray we'll begin to see these numbers go down. God, through your great wisdom, I pray uh, that you would grant um, knowledge and wisdom to develop uh, medication, treatment, vaccines, so that we can once again get back to doing what you've called us to do. It's so hard um, to, to worship as a church and minister as a church under these circumstances. But God, help us not give up. Even during this, this time, we need to be doing everything we can. Father, we do pray that we'll see uh, these numbers go down so that we can once again get back to doing what you have called us to do. We pray for all of those on our sick list. God, we pray you would have your healing hand on each and every one of those folks. And um, Father, we pray for the unspoken request as well. We pray for our shut-ins. Um, God, we pray for those recovering from procedures. We pray for those with surgeries and procedures coming up. Father, that you would just be with them during this, uh, this process. God, have your healing hand on them. And uh, God, we, we do pray for our church. I pray, God, you'd keep everybody engaged in some way. Yes. Uh, individually, Lord, may they be studying your word and spending time in prayer. Um, God, bless our Sunday school teachers and classes as they seek to stay in touch with their members and, and meet individually. And God, be with our worship services. Lord, I, I don't want anybody to catch uh, the coronavirus because they came to your house. But Lord, I want to see more and more people feel comfortable coming to your house. Protect us when we come together for worship. And uh, God, continue to give us wisdom and guidance as, as leaders in the church to know what to do and how to do and, and all of those things, God. This, this pandemic has reminded us, if we needed reminding, uh, that we need you each and every day. Uh, we need your guidance, we need your protection, and we need your blessing. And God, that is certainly true in our country, right now more so than, than normal. We need, God, you to intervene and once again govern in the affairs of men. Father, I pray that you would give peace pray, Lord, that you would send revival from uh, coast to coast. Uh, Lord, and we understand that, that revival does not come through politics. It does not come through the educational system. It does not come through the military. Lord, revival comes through your church, and it begins in your church. So, God, send revival that we can uh, turn our hearts and our minds toward you and submit to your authority and your word. Then, God, we can enjoy uh, the blessings as your people in this country. Do be with our leaders. Protect them. Give them wisdom and discernment as well to, to know how to lead and guide us during this pandemic and this crisis and all the other things. Not just a, a physical uh, sickness and pandemic, um, but, God, we have such division and civil unrest in our, our country. Um, God, we just pray you would bring peace and prosperity. Uh, here and all across the world because we know that, that the devil uses these things to distract us from our mission. And, uh, Father, we want the gospel to go forth and to move in power and change lives all over the world for your glory. God, do be with us today as we study your word together. Uh, through your spirit and through your word, encourage us and strengthen us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, Psalm 127 is where we are today. Psalm 127. We continue through the psalm, the Psalms of Ascents. Uh, we still have a good ways to go before we're completely done. I love these psalms. I preach through them several times. Every time I go through them, um, they end up being different than the last time I, I <laughs> talked through.
through them. Uh, the Lord seems to show you something different. And you know, we got some we got some Sunday school teachers in here. Maybe you found this to be true too. God will use His Word in accordance to the context of your life and what's going on in your world. You know, so when you're looking at it, looking at these songs right now with all of our all we're going through physically and again as a, as a nation, you kind of see it. You see some things that jump out to you that you didn't see before, and um, He has done that again. I, I was taught in school, um, scriptures have one interpretation. There's only one interpretation. Scripture can only be saying one thing, but it can have many applications. And those applications is what God uses to speak to your heart, depending on where you are right now in your life and what's going on in your life and in your world. So, with that being said, preacher, I also think this mind to well. Yes. I have uh, read scripture in read through it, and next time I read it, I say, gosh, how in the world could I miss that? Yeah. I mean, it's wide open there. Yeah, I do the same thing. And uh, it's just unbelievable. But let me tell you something, too. Uh, in this pan pandemic, uh, I read the Bible through. Now, I didn't say I studied it. I right. just read it every yeah. verse yeah. from the beginning to the Isn't end. Isn't that good? Yeah. yeah. And, so, you know, peace comes from that, doesn't oh, it? Oh, Lord, yeah. Peace comes from yes, it. Yes, sir. And there's, there's peace here in Psalm 127, too. And it's, it's funny, again, uh, we're celebrating our nation's independence uh, this week. And there, yeah. there's a word here for, for that as well. Psalm 127, the Bible says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands or in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The psalmist writes here about the efforts of man apart from and without the help of the Lord. Now, by way of introduction, laboring is not discouraged here. There's, there's two wrong approaches in regard to our efforts and, and labor. Uh, number one is to believe we are to do nothing and expect God to do it all. Well, the Bible never encourages that. Uh, the other mistake is to believe that we do it all without considering the Lord. And I think that's what the psalmist is warning us against here. I believe what, what God would have us to do is everything he's called us and equipped us to do. But even still, with that being said, there are some things God has to do. There are some things only God can provide. And I think that's the, that's the, 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 the structure and the main teaching of this psalm. When we think about that word house, unless the Lord builds the house, it causes me to think about three things. And the word translated house there is a very generic word. And you have to look at the context to see exactly uh, what the Bible is talking about. But when we think about it, or when I think about the word house there, I, I think about it in three different contexts. Number one would be our homes and our families, naturally. When we think about our house, I think about uh, my home. Not my home structurally. But I think about the family unit that, that dwells there. Number two, when I think about a house, I think about a church. We call this the house of God. It is a house of worship. But then number three, I also think about it in the context of our country. Because this is where we live. It's the people we engage. It's, it's the structure of government that we as citizens of this country have to learn to to live in and be effective for the cause of Christ in. Now, first and foremost, we are citizens of a heavenly country and a heavenly home. Um, I'm, a, I'm a natural born U.S. citizen, 
but this world is not my home. I'm just, I'm just yeah. passing through. I'm thankful today that th this place is temporary, though I love my country. So I want us to think about what the Bible is saying here in Psalm 127 about needing the help of the Lord within those three contexts. Now what he says is, <clears throat> unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Uh, then later on it says the watchman stays awake in vain. In verse 2, it says, it is vain for you to rise up early. So whenever you see a word or a phrase repeated in a, in a passage of scripture, you know it's very important. That word translated vain there means useless. It means to no avail. It means whatever context you want to look at, house in, without God and his help, it will be useless. It will not accomplish what God intended for it to accomplish. You can have a family without the help and blessing of the Lord, but it's not going to be all that God intended it to be. You can have a church building, but it's not going to be God uh, without God. It's not going to be all that he intended it to be. You can have a nation without God's blessing and protection, but it's not going to be all that God intended it uh, to be. So that's the context we are looking at this in. But what does it mean when the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house? What does it mean for the Lord to be the builder or the architect of whatever house you're, you're talking about? Those three contexts we're going to look at today. Well, number one, I think it means he is to have preeminence. If, if he's the builder, that means he has preeminence. If we're talking about a house, we would say that God is to be the foundation. We are to begin and end with the help and power of God. He must be the foundation. Joshua said in a very famous passage of scripture, as for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. And he's using that, that word house to describe his family Unit. You remember what he told everybody else. You can, you can worship and serve the God you served on the other side of the river. But as for me, this is an individual decision. God has blessed me with a family. He's blessed me with children. And I've made the decision. We're going to give God preeminence. All right? So it means he is the foundation. When Jesus cleansed the temple in the New Testament, he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. What great authority. Christ had, and he says right there in that, that script, this is my house. And you know what? I know God meets and deals with his people differently now than he did in the, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they went to the temple, and they went to the tabernacle because God said, I will meet you there if you'll do this. Now, we don't have to come to our individual churches to meet God. We, we come to worship God together corporately, but this is still to be his Church, Paul said Christ has become the chief cornerstone. Paul says he is the head of the church. So if we're going to operate the way God would have us to as a church, we must give him preeminence. And, and a part of that, especially in the context of a church, I believe, if he has preeminence, then his purposes will be our purposes. And we're preaching through a series called Essential Church on Sunday. On Sunday mornings, that, that's really the main thing I want us to take away from, from that. If this is God's house, then we need to be doing what he's called us to do. And we need to do it the way he has called us to do it. We can't do it opposite to what he tells us to do and then ask him to, to bless us. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But this is to be the house of God. He has laid the foundation. Then Psalm 32 says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So uh, any, any, I think, study of American history will lead one to conclude that at the very least, our nation enjoyed a very Christian beginning. The, the Christian foundation uh, was, was in place, um, and I think God did that to in turn use the United States of America as a launching pad for worldwide missions and has done that for for a long time the bible also tells a story of two builders 
The Bible says one built his house on the sand and the other on the rock. And ultimately, as is always the case, a storm came. It doesn't matter if you're striving to serve the Lord and if, even if you've made him the foundation of what you're doing. Storms are still going to come. I, I don't like these televangelists that lead people to believe if you have enough faith, you can just soar above the storms of life and you can avoid all the trials and, and tribulations. But that's, that's just not true. And it's, and it's not biblical. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the greatest church planner and missionary the world's ever known, went through storms and, and trials, and so did the disciples and the apostles. It's, it's just not biblical to think that. And don't think if you're trying to have a Christian home that you're not going to have storms, all right? Storms are going to come this side of heaven. But here's the difference. If you're built on the rock, if your foundation is Christ, if you've made the decision as a home, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If your church has made uh, the, the determination that he's going to be the rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail uh, against it. If we as a nation have God as our Lord, then when the storms come, we will survive. Think of, think of the devil as the big bad wolf and he's going to come at some point in time. And I'm not calling y'all three little pigs. All right? I'm not saying that. But I, I'm just saying when the big bad wolf comes and he's going to huff and he's going to puff and he's going to try to blow your house down. But if, you, if you're built on the rock, if Jesus is your foundation, you can stand the storms of life. So the first thing I think this means is Christ is to have preeminence. Number two, though, I think if it's the Lord building the house, it says something about his precepts. If God is truly the foundation of what we're doing in our homes, in our country, and in our churches, his precepts will be followed. God gave specific instructions for how to build the temple, specific instructions for how to structure the church, how to establish and structure a home. He's also giving us, given us principles as citizens of this country to live by. All right, And really, no matter what system of government you live under in this world, God has given you instructions for how to live as a citizen. For God to have preeminence means it seeks to accomplish his purposes his way. A church that seeks to operate outside of God's will and word will not enjoy the blessings of God. Time and again, we have seen Denominations in this country, evangelical denominations here, here of late, make decisions to compromise the Word of God and to stop teaching biblical truth and absolute truth. They've gone the way of the world. They've, they, they've taken polls and surveys, and they've determined uh, that we need to be more inclusive here, and we need to water down our preaching here uh, because, you know, if we preach the whole Bible literally the way it's written, well, it's going to cause division. Isn't that what Christ said he would do? Uh, he said, you, you, you're either going to love me or, or hate me. All right, so they've made a decision, a lot of these denominations, and I'm not trying to disparage them. I'm just giving you factual information here. As those denominations have chosen popularity over the word of God, those denominations have shrunk. They've lost power. They've lost influence. They're not reaching people with, with the gospel. Even if their hearts were right in trying to be inclusive and loving, friend, we can't make those decisions apart from the word of God. And if we read a verse of scripture and it appears like God is not loving, we're wrong. He's not. Because God is love. And if he has said something in his word, we need to follow those precepts. And I pray our denomination, I pray the Southern Baptists will continue to be people of the book, people of, of the word. And I'm thankful and believe that we are right now. That's not always guaranteed. We just need to pray that'll be uh, the, the case. A home that wants the blessings of God without following the word of God will not stand when the storms come. Nor can our children grow up to be arrows used for good if we do not raise them to be that. Did you read that, that scripture? Verse 4 says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, 
so are the children of one's youth. Well, see, the power and the usefulness does not come in the fact that you have an arrow. You've got to have someone with the skill to shoot that arrow. And the Bible says we are to train up our children in the way they are to go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. We can't train them up with the wisdom and ways of the world and then expect them to hit a bullseye later on in life. You see what I'm saying? We, we've got to follow the precepts of God. And I'm afraid this is where we are right now uh, as a country. A nation that rejects God's authority, calls right what God has called wrong, and call wrong what God has called right, cannot claim the blessings of God. It, it, it cannot. Uh, a French uh, philosopher came to visit um, the United States not long after our independence was, was won. His desire was to see the secret to America's success. And after visiting many of the places, here's the determination he made. He said, America's greatness is tied to her goodness. But if she ever ceases to be good, she'll cease to be great. And friend, we need to realize and recognize that the United States of America, and I'm not trying to be political here, but we are not blessed by God by, by some eternal divine decree. All right, there is one, one nation of people God has said, you will always be my people, and that's, that's the nation of, of Israel, the people of Israel. For us as the church, as the United States of America, we can only claim and pray for his blessing as long as we're living in obedience. If we cease to be good, we will cease to be great. By the way, let me throw this in here. Those who are lost, they're not going to do it. So it's up to the church. When we're watching these things on television, I tell you what I try to remind myself of. Uh, the, the people at fault here is the church, man. We're supposed to be salt and light. We need to be making a positive difference. And, and if nothing else, we need to be trying to advance this church. We need to see Christianity grow and blossom again because as we said in the beginning it'll only be through God's uh, relationship with God and Jesus Christ that we will see real change come all right number three I think the Bible teaches here that if God builds the house we will enjoy his power and we see his power um, evidenced in three ways at least that I want to share with you from this passage number one his power is evidenced in his protection. Look at verse 1 again. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. You know what I'm afraid happened with the United States, especially as we got to the point we, we saw all the blessings of God. And we thought God just loves us more than everybody else. So uh, you, well, we, can, we can live how we want to because we are now. We have now achieved a position and place of power. Well, friend, without the help of God, no nation can stand. Amen. No nation can stand. And it doesn't matter how mighty our military is. It doesn't matter how high Jerusalem's walls were. When you turn your back on God, you lose the hand of protection. Right. Not only do I need God's protection as a as a nation, man, I need his protection over my family. I pray all the time, God, place a hedge of protection around our, our family. And I'm sure you pray something similar uh, for yours. And you can pr provide all of the material things your children and your spouse could ever dream of. But you still need the protection of God over your family. We need to pray God's protection over our community and our world right now with this pandemic. Let's, let's pray even if these numbers of infections go up, that the number of deaths not go up and the number of hospitalizations not, not go up. Then maybe we can tell a certain uh, governor uh, in, in the Northeast that it was God that heard and answered our prayer. We need God's protection over our church. And I'm not talking about people breaking in and doing stuff like that. We need to protect the unity and the fellowship of our church. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
We don't enjoy his protection. Number two, his power is evidenced in the feast. Look at verse two. It said, it is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows. I love this line. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Oh, there's nothing like a good night of rest. Many times we'll lay our head down and that's when the devil begins to take control of our thoughts and our worries and our anxieties. Uh, he brings up our past. He brings up things that's out of our control. We're thinking about bills that are coming and doctor's appointments that are coming. We've just watched the news and then laid down, which I would not recommend or prescribe <laughs> for you to do if you want a good night's sleep. Find the episode of Andy Griffith. That'll help you too. But we need the peace of God, don't we? The peace of God, the Bible says, surpasses understanding. In other words, God gives peace when it doesn't make sense. And one thing our nation needs right now is a dose of heavenly peace that passes all understanding. We need peace in our homes, and we need the peace of God in our churches. And then number three, we see the power of God evidenced in prosperity. Look at verse three. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Some people read this psalm, and the, the, the contrast is so great between the first two verses and the last three verses. It's almost like two separate psalms. But if you read it in the context of God's blessing, it all fits together. Behold, children are a heritage of the Lord. Not only is the protection God provides and the peace God provides and the foundation God provides, but he says even children are, are a, a blessing from the Lord. True prosperity only comes from the like I said a moment ago, there's some things we desperately need that only God can give. We need some things only God can give. That is certainly true uh, for a nation. Like I said a moment ago, uh, our military might, the strength of our economy, all that's in vain without the help of God. Uh, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. I said a, a couple weeks ago, I've, I've now been in ministry um, since 1998, uh, 22 years. This is my 20th year of pastoring. And, and that means I've pastored under several um, administrations in the White House. You know what I have found to be true in every situation? God's good. Amen. And in every situation, it doesn't matter who's in that White House and who's got control of the Senate or the Congress. God's still on the throne. You know what I mean? There's some there, there's peace that that, that provides. And, and we need that. Not only do we need it in our families, not only do we need prosperity for our nation, but it's true for our church. Let me tell you, you can have the best programs, you can have the best staff, you can be in the best location. Uh, I've I've known some guys in, in college that you know, I feel the Lord leading me to plant a church in, in Atlanta. Or plant a church in this large city. Really what they're saying is, I want to, I want to be where the people are. You know, my, my church can grow uh, if I'm there. But true prosperity can't be summed up in the number of people in your pews. Or how much money is in the offering plate. Or how nice and how new your facilities are. Man, I hope our church, our people don't make the mistake of thinking that because we'll have a new location and a new building, that people are going to automatically uh, come to know the Lord and be helped and be ministered to and be discipled just because we moved down there. No, we still got to do our part, and then we got to beg God to move because only God can do what needs to be done. We've been looking a lot at Acts chapter 2, and we're talking about the church and our structure and what we do and how we do it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, after saying everything the apostles in the New Testament church were doing, which was in obedience to what God had told them to do, listen to what the Bible says. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who added to the church? Was it, was it Peter? Was it the apostles? No, it was the Lord. He added those people who were being saved. That's the blessing from God. I, I can't save people. I can preach the gospel and then beg the Holy Spirit of God to speak to their heart and to take that seed and plant it so deep and so sure that they respond with a saving faith and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
God's blessings to the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2 was tied to their obedience. Remember, he, Jesus said, don't do anything until I tell you, until the Holy Spirit comes. So they waited on God. Sometimes that's the hardest thing in the world to do is wait on God. I don't have a waiting here. I, I, I have to be moving. I have to be doing something. And sometimes I can try to get ahead of God, get out of step with God. Sometimes he says, wait. Then he says, when I come, I want you to do it this way. So you know what they did? They did it that way. God said, I want you to preach this. I want you to preach the gospel. So you know what they preached? They preached the gospel. So they did what God told them to do, how God told them to do it. And lo and behold, they prayed and asked God to bless. And what happened? He blessed. It's, it's not a secret formula. All right? We know what it takes to receive the blessing and the peace and the protection of God. But man, our flesh pulls us in the other direction. Tries to get us to be self-sufficient. Tries to get us to water down and compromise and do all these things. But church, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Whether we're talking about our country, whether we're talking about our families, or whether we're talking about our churches, we need the help in the hand of all. Father, I thank you so much for your direction and your guidance and your, and your word. Father, forgive me for all of those times when I've tried to do it under my own power. I've tried to do it my way. Didn't wait on you. and Didn't pray. God, forgive me for that. I thank you, Lord, for your patience and long-suffering. And God, today, as we dismiss, we do pray for our nation. We pray, God, for you to do what only you can do, to bring the peace and the real prosperity that only you can bring. And we're talking about prosperity. We're not talking about the stock market. We're not talking about political success. God, what we're talking about is your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, be with us as a church to make you the foundation of everything we do, not just in word but in practice. May we follow your direction and precepts. Then, God, we can ask for your blessings. And, Lord, be with the families that make up this church, the families that make up this community, country, and all over the world. God, if we'd have stronger homes and stronger families, we'd have a stronger nation. We'd have stronger churches. That's why the devil seeks to draw a bullseye on every marriage and every young person and every home, every family. But, God, we know that you can provide protection if we would just turn to you. And rely on you. And God help us to do that. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Thank y'all for Thank being you. here.